That's great. Well, <clears throat> one of the, the things I wanted to start with, and if you uh, get Crane's Detroit Briz- business, uh, Chad Livengood uh, uh, did a, a front page story uh, called A Bridge Too Many that gets into the whole issue of uh, Maddie Maroon and the Ambassador Bridge and the new span, A Bridge Too Many. Uh, you would say, Pat O'Keefe, a, an appropriate headline. It is. It's almost comical. Uh, and how were you guys involved? You've been involved in this. So I believe it was Proposition 5 that was put to the voters uh, relative to uh, whether the state had the authority to uh, execute an agreement for a new bridge in a joint venture agreement with Canada. And we did the uh, economic feasibility study uh, for that, independent, um, trying to um, understand what the flow of traffic was and really analyze mm-hmm. some of MDOT's information that uh, was being conveyed to the public. And we had some very interesting findings. We posted our report uh, on our website. It was viewed by thousands of people who were interested in the topic. Because there have been some previous studies saying that the uh, traffic is going to continue to grow in the Ambassador Bridge and that a second span was needed, right? That's correct. It, and it was in, based on an entirely set of faulty um, assumptions and projections. I mean, it took, you know, in our world, the hockey stick projection to new heights. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and we tried to expose that uh, to the taxpayers in the state of Michigan. It was billed mm-hmm. as a free bridge, which, um, you know, we never thought as a firm that that was the case based on the data that we looked at. Right. Um, there was definitely uh, tax revenue that was going to be impacted both at the uh, Blue Water Bridge, the Ambassador Bridge, and the uh, Detroit-Windsor Tunnel that was going to be impacted. And and one of the faulty assumptions that was made in it was that much of the commercial traffic that goes across um, the uh, pathways that I just described um, is automotive Mm -hmm. uh, uh, parts and and supplies and things that move. And we extrapolated that showed an order for the traffic numbers to hit where um, MDOT and their consultant were saying we had to have almost, uh, memory serves me right, a 50 or 60 million uh, vehicle North American market, hmm. which was... When's the last time it was 50 million, million vehicles? Oh, it's, it's never gone over 20. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, it, 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 17 people are slapping high fives and having, you know, great years in the automotive industry. And so that was combined with the fact that parts were going to be lighter. And so, in, in many cases, smaller mm-hmm. as vehicles mm-hmm. were shrinking. And we just thought the whole premise for a second bridge was, was faulty. And it was in the face of declining volumes of traffic for both car and truck at the time. And I think the Crane's article points that out. I mean, it's, it's, it's almost laughable that that, was, that data is ignored by the state of Michigan, MDOT, and the people who are promoting it because the second bridge never made any sense economically. So... And you weren't, you know, someone might say, oh, you were bought and paid for by the Maroons for this study. And that's, that's not the case at all. There's some credibility to this study and, and, and uh, how you went into the process uh, with some ground rules up front. It, that's exactly right. I mean, one of the things that we sell in many of the transactions that we're involved with is our objectivity and mm-hmm. credibility. And, you know, there is no question that we get contacted by overzealous prospective clients <laughs> that, want us to be their mouthpiece for transactions. And we were clearly not going to do that. But the evidence was so overwhelming that it was irrefutable. Mm -hmm. I I appeared Mm -hmm. on 25 uh, radio talk stations to discuss the findings. There was no rebuttal report to our findings because they were fact-based. And so, you know, the Cranes uh, and Chad Livengood talking about this now is – really the exact position we took three or four years ago. (laughs) And so the dilemma now for Canada is in order to entice a private-public partnership, which was promoted, it has to economically make sense. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. you have still a competing, you know, crossway, arguably three, but one big one that's a couple miles apart, and you have declining traffic for a bridge that's going to be fairly expensive. um, You know, it's not going to entice many outside investors to want to, put their nickels down to do it. So, so, so what's next, do you think, for, the, for this whole situation? Well, Canada's, I, I mean, they got an all-in bet. I mean, they have rerouted mm-hmm. the uh, 401, um, you know, connector to the, to the new bridge. 
the problem they're going to have is it's going to be real expensive. And they almost, in order to divert traffic that way, have to make it probably a free bridge for a while. Mm. to get people used to using it. They've made it very convenient for trucks to come off 401, mm-hmm. you know, roll down the uh, the connector and make a short little left and head downriver to, uh, you know, to the new bridge. So there will be some, uh, some advantage to that. We're talking to Pat O'Keefe, the founder and CEO of O'Keefe, a financial and strategic advisory firm. Uh, we invite you at any time to join in at the conversation at 313 313- Seven seven eight seventy six hundred on AM Superstation, the future of radio. Don Tanner in for David Bullock, who should be back next week. We're uh, more than hoping we know he will be back uh, out with the flu this week. Pat, you, you wear a number of hats, as I, as I mentioned. I, I want to talk uh, about an organization here in just a moment that you've also been named CEO of. But while we keep it in the headlines a little bit, you you and your firm have done a lot of work with uh, not only municipalities, but uh, with also schools and school districts, uh, maybe uh, looking at some financial issues. And uh, Detroit News Today, a story on the uh, old DPS losing out on $6.5 million of state money uh, because of failure to file proper paperwork. Um, again, this is the old DPS, but uh, that, that old regime, uh, lots of problems in the past, uh, mismanaged. What, what's your take on this whole situation? Well, again, these dollars um, were earmarked for legacy costs, so mm-hmm. it doesn't impact um, the school system today that it's run. But there were certainly some legacy obligations that were left behind in the restructure of uh, DPS. So, unfortunately, there's six and a half million dollars um, less ammunition to deal with uh, those lingering issues. So, the good news is it's not really impacting the go forward. I suppose. Uh, you know, with the new superintendent, he's got to be a little disheartened. I would think that, so. <laughs> you know, that, that they still can't seem to get it right. But the, the good news is I don't think it will impact the uh, classroom. And things seem to be moving in the right direction with uh, Dr. Vitae in charge. And uh, we're all hoping for the best there. It's an ongoing challenge, uh, our schools. Um, you're involved in uh, potentially bringing a new model to bear in Detroit. Um, talk about that a little bit. It's well, interesting. It, it, it is from a number of ins- circumstances. Let me just by way of background. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I left uh, Deloitte as a partner, um, I went with a company that was a very large uh, residential developer who had never left the city of Detroit. And uh, we developed with partners two fairly prolific um, developments at the time. One was uh, Greyhaven mm-hmm. Apartments, which was 190 units right on um, – the riverfront by the Garwood Mansion there with had marinas, and it was done with the Michigan State Housing Development Authority. We did the lofts at Rivertown, which wow. was a be- wow. beautiful project, 176 loft-style units. And that was in um, the late 80s, early 90s, mm-hmm. when there really wasn't a lot of development activity going on. I think at the same time, uh, Max Fisher and Al Taubman started the Riverfront Apartments. Right. And, you know, th- that was pretty much it. And, you know, one of the things... Being a developer, we had a fairly large home building operation. And one of the things I learned as the chief financial officer, and this is still a problem for the city of Detroit, is that in order to attract for sale housing, now not the renters who come in and out that are a little more transient, Mm -hmm. but people who are really willing to put a stake in the ground, you have to have strong public safety and strong public education. Absolutely. And the city, through the bankruptcy uh, process and under Mike uh, Duggan's leadership has done a pretty good job and improvement in the public safety aspect. Still not perfect, but considerably better with the, you know, the lighting projects the lighting, and, and yep. things that have gone on. I mean, you, you got to give them a lot of kudos for you know the continued uh, r- role that they're making mm-hmm. relative to that. But public education is still the problem, and so when people start having families, they move. You have a lot of young people here in the city uh, that end up leaving once they start having kids. And, you know, as they, as they say, the, uh, mm-hmm. you know, good swimmers jump first. Mm-hmm. And so sometimes, um, you know, the families and the children that are left behind um, take more educational dollars to get them to the same spot. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so you're dealing with declining resources, uh, a population that is challenge in the educational process, and we continue to do the same things over and over. And a lot of those uh, challenge transportationally. Uh, a lot of people say, well, you can do schools of choice, and you can 
take your school, your, you know, your your child somewhere a better school, but that's not always the case. Transportation is a big issue. It is. So, um, I, I befriended Reverend Williams, um, Charles, uh, who mm-hmm. ha- has a show now on nine ten, and uh, over the last couple of years, we have heightened the discussion relative to um, education within the city of Detroit, and. Charles is an interesting fellow because he uh, is in a very uh, depressed area within the city of Detroit at Old King Solomon Baptist Church. Mm-hmm. He sees and does the hand-to-hand combat every day with the challenges um, within the community. And he also um, has an ROTC background, so he understands the benefits of uh, structure, structure <laughs> it, it, especially Teamwork. in raising uh, young boys. And so I had... Uh, just got back from the Mackinac Conference, and they were debating about, you know, how more money was going to fix the Detroit public schools. Mm -hmm. And I'm in the turnaround business, and money is never the issue. You can throw, you know, more money at almost anything. If it's, uh, you know, functionally broke, it never fixes it. Right. And we really heightened the discussion as to what changes. What is it, you know, structurally that changes? And so he and I visited a couple charter schools, and we went around trying to find out, you know, what would work. And his model was to take boys, to start the model with boys, um, sixth graders, and to take them through 12th grade in uh, a boarding school area so that they could control the environment after school where kids could continue to learn. Something that's been done forever in in, in Europe and... Uh, well, right. Ivy, yeah. Ivy League and Cran- right. here, Cranbrook. Cranbrook, Archer Lake, St. Mary's. Right. And a boarding school. I mean, there's a lot of great uh, boarding schools. But not in Detroit. No. And, and the concept was that if you could put children in an environment where they were well-fed, disciplined, and had structure in their environment around education, you could make a difference. And that was an interesting proposition. Mm-hmm. Um, coming from a Catholic school background, I certainly understood, you know, being a, you know, unruly uh, young boy. <laughs> not you, yeah, not that, you, Pat. That discipline, you know, probably played a, a large role in, in my development. But, you know, it's interesting because you're in school several hours a day, but then you have to leave school. And and these kids don't always have the proper environment, neighborhood, uh, to, to, to go down the right pathway, study. Well, I mean, mentored? yeah, and you've got two great examples already within the city with Dan Gilbert's uh, Detroit Boxing mm-hmm. Club, which provides an after-school venue for kids to study first, and then if they want to learn self-defense, they could do that after. Or Mitch Album with his you know music school again, another after-school program. Right. And what impressed me in my discussion with Reverend Williams was he said to me, he says, "I have twelve forty-year-old grandmothers in my congregation." And he says, I see the cycle, you know, repeating over and over. And people are desperate. And they, they want to do better, but there's no path. And, right. you know, he came up with this boarding school concept. And we then started talking about neither one of us being educators. So this was an idea. Trying to figure out how we further the discussion. So we went around and we talked. And he is very close of having a relationship with uh, – one of the old-time Detroit Catholic League high schools hmm. that has a mission um, to develop urban education, which is uh, Birmingham Brother Rice, to see if they can't help with the educational process. That's fantastic. Now, Pat, we have a couple of uh, callers, and I'm, I'm kind of a, a neophyte here. I didn't realize that there are these flashing things on the screen here people are, are waiting for us. So Jerry's been uh, waiting for uh, eight and a half minutes, and I, I, Jerry, I apologize. Welcome to 9 and 10 no, AM no, Superstation. No good morning. <laughs> no problem. Good morning to you, Mr. Dan, and good morning to your guest, Mr. O'Keefe, I believe. Uh, I do wish you, uh, gentlemen, and to all the listeners, happy holidays and Merry Christmas. You too. What's on your mind this morning? And, and In my mind, we're talking about the bridge earlier, mm-hmm. Mr. Dan and Mr. Keith. Uh, my my thought was, you know, the new bridge, if it is built, you know, will be a lot of properties, a lot of houses, a lot of apartments. Uh, there will be property destroyed and will be gone. Uh, my question here, uh, why bridge? Why couldn't it be replaced by a tunnel similar to Windsor Tunnel? 
uh, that was my thought, and I just want to uh, see what's the answer from you and your guest. And uh, thank you again for taking my call, and God bless you. You too. Wonderful. Have a wonderful holiday. And, and Pat, you're smiling a little bit and shaking your head and uh, a tunnel. Yeah, You haven't heard that talked about a whole lot, have you? Everybody's well, focused on another bridge. Well, in fact, I, I have. I have a very good friend, um, Lauren James, who um, was part of the, the authority um, that – advise me as early as last Friday that there is a second tunnel that nobody talks about. Oh, really? And um, the, the, the problem with the tunnel right now is it would, it's not high enough for double-stacked loads to go through it. When was this tunnel built? Oh, it, it goes back. It's, I mean, it's not, nothing new. Okay. But it's there. Hmm. And so the, the conversation was is maybe there's an opportunity to expand the tunnel and you know, allow for some of this additional commerce mm-hmm. to come through um, a tunnel under the river. Interesting. Which is a, yeah, it is an interesting proposition, and I have not heard the discussion on that advance too much. But you know, to the caller's point, if that was an opportunity, because there is a lot of property taking, there's still property that needs to be taken. Mm-hmm. Um, I would argue also, you know, the the roads that are going to be on. That are going to be need to be repaired and maintained for that um, new traffic um, might not have the same impact if we mm-hmm. could develop a rail system. Detroit is uniquely positioned, and this goes back to one of the strategies in the, in the Detroit bankruptcy that I thought was a swing and a miss by the parties involved. Detroit has an opportunity to be an international distribution center. When you think that we have the Great Lakes, we have riverfront property, the city owns an airport, rail system, a tremendous rail system. There mm-hmm. is a a spur um, downriver where all four rail systems um, meet so that it allows competition in terms of uh, rail access. And uh, there's opportunity there if somebody can put all the pieces together. And I thought the bankruptcy was the best way to deal with that and would have created a lot of value, but uh, nobody focused on it. Interesting. We're going to go to Joseph. I want to get back to the schools here in a moment. But, uh, Joseph, you've also been very patient. Thanks for waiting. And good morning. Welcome to 910 AM Superstation. Good morning. I got a whole lot of points because I, I just love it when folks come on and they talk about the problems of Detroit. But the, the, let's start at number one. It kills me that they have a meeting 300 miles away in Mackinac about Detroit. <laughs> Why don't they have a meeting? <laughs> you know, here's a bunch of white folks sitting up there talking about the black folks 300 miles away. You'll get no argument from me on that thing. issue. And, and that's, that's crazy. That's crazy. It, it, it's just crazy. Then, to your second point, we talk about the schools messed up. Well, they, and, then, and when, they, when you read these stories over here, it's like the black folks messed up the money again. Uh, wait a minute. 17 years, the state of Michigan has been running our schools, okay? The money that millions you say we miss, well, why don't you call up Roy Roberts? Remember, he was the turnaround guy from General Motors that could make the difference. Why don't you call him up and say, hey, Roy, what happened, Okay. Don't make it seem like, oh, these black folks in Detroit blew it again, because we didn't. We well, Joseph, ran it. And yeah. when they took it, and don't forget, when, when, they, when they took it, we voted for what? A billion plus in a millage to fix it and to make it better. And it wasn't no worse than, there were 65 other districts that were just as, were doing worse than Detroit when they took it. But the problem was certain people couldn't get their hands on the money. So now England takes over the schools. And now ask yourself this, where's the money at? Show us anything where that money went to build something. And now what does the state of Michigan say? We don't have the money to have an audit to find out where the money went. No, the question and problem is they don't want people to know where that money really went and what it didn't do. Okay? So yeah, when we start no, talking I... about Detroit, we need to start really asking. the A lot of this stuff is not wasn't done by us. It was done by others on behalf, so-called, for us. And we, we're looking at, you know, the, the homes, neighborhoods. I agree. These kids leave school, messed up situation. Uh, Mr. Gilbert and his company helped some of those loans, remember? Those predatory loans? He's in court now with the Department of Justice. People don't talk about that, do they? Why? We don't want to offend the great white hope down there. Okay, so a lot of this stuff that we... Okay. For those that were controlling us. Joseph, I appreciate the call, and I think it's important to say, and uh, you you make some very good points. If we had more time, we could talk about Mackinac. 
things get done up there, uh, without a doubt. And there's reasons it's up there, but we don't have time to get into that. Just remember, this is not, you're right, this is not uh, city of Detroit, uh, the, the people, black, white issue. It's it's an education issue, and it's people mismanaging money, and, and Pat, uh, mismanaging uh, a lot of things uh, through bribery and, and mismanagement of funds. And I think all of us, this region depends on uh, so the schools coming back in the city of Detroit for, for all races, creeds, and colors. It's a problem that needs to be fixed, but I, I smile as I listen to Joseph because he is uh, well-researched on some of the issues. Mm-hmm. And the points Absolutely. he makes, I would not disagree with. And, um, you know, one of the big arguments was also uh, the state of Michigan's uh, revenue sharing with the city of Detroit, and that maybe that caused some of the problems with some mm-hmm. of the funding issues. In that there was a deal made, you know, with the casino tax that uh, you know the city initially fought, saying you know we were not the, the state actually cut back funds right. that they had allegedly frozen when the state revenue wasn't there, and the city said, hey, we didn't bargain for that. It was bad enough we had to be frozen, mm-hmm. but then you, you want now to cut us back, and uh, that fight didn't go anywhere, which clearly impacted the city of Detroit hundreds of millions of dollars. So, Joseph, your points are, are well made. You Absolutely. Are, you are well researched on a number of issues. You and I may disagree on uh, what the fixes are going forward, but um, I understand your point of view. We thank you. We have another caller. Esprit is on the line. Welcome to 910 AM Superstation. And we're brief on time. Esprit, thanks for holding on. I think we've just got a couple of minutes left. Okay, well, listen. Uh, I was listening to the last uh, couple of comments. And one, I want to acknowledge the fact that both of us or the whole station or this program uh, today acknowledge the fact that there's a lot of resources in the city of Detroit and how empowered and rich it is with untapped resources, and they need to be tapped into. Mm -hmm. But the thing about it is the resources are there. Uh, And then also in regards to the education system, The focal point of the education system needs to be changed. Now, I'm saying this for uh, to say this for both points, and that is until the people are empowered in the city of Detroit, Detroit will not change. The education system will not change, and nor will the distribution of resources will be adequately just uh, distributed in the city of Detroit. And so, if these resources and the focal point of education has not changed, then therefore re- Detroit will remain stagnant and continue to have the problems historically as it always has. That's my comment, and thank you very much. Thank you, Esprit. We appreciate it. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Pat, I know we've got about a, a minute or so. Final final thoughts on education? We're going to have to have you back. <laughs> we needed an hour for you. Well, I mean, you can see it, it touches the nerve of everybody. It It's important that everybody gets educated and we need to give our young people a chance and it's it's an outrage quite frankly of what we've you know what we've done within the city of detroit and uh you know, i spend time on it because i'm passionate about education and uh you know i hope that uh it gets fixed because it needs to if we're going to make detroit a great place to live and even a greater place to live then public education needs to get fixed Thanks, Pat. We're going to get you back on, if not with me, with uh, someone else here on 910 AM Superstation. And it looks like we're winding down on this first segment. I want to thank you again, Pat O'Keefe, the founder and CEO of O'Keefe Financial and Strategic Advisory Firm. Uh, hand on the pulse of pretty much everything uh, uh, around the country when it, when it comes to uh, financials and um, helping business move forward. Thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me, Don. Merry Christmas. This is 910 AM Superstation, the future of radio. Don Tanner for David Bullock and The People Show. We're coming back. It's time for your weather and traffic update. Currently in the D.